Okay? One of them is a brooder's whale, too big for them to keep and too difficult. One of them was a grey whale, again too big, too difficult, and recently two pilot whales, but they kept another two. So that is the full success story for SeaWorld. In 49 years, I think that's abysmal, disgusting, and how can they hang their hat on that? It's all about money. There is no doubt. These animals are worth so much money to them. We know that they're worth at least 10 million US dollars. Probably a lot more. That's a, that's a number that has been given to us through the media, but um, from the insurance industry. But the thing that really, really just gets to me, ethically, personally, scientifically, for all the, the reasons that you can imagine, is how we treat these animals, or how, rather how they don't treat them, or how they do. Sadly. So we have at the top um, a picture of Lolita. Um, those of you that were at Blackfish last night heard quite a bit about her, and then this morning with Howard's very interesting story about Lolita. This is her complete tank at the top there. She's been in there for 42 years. It's roughly the size of this room. It's just disgusting. Uh, below we have Tibicum in a medical tank. He was kept in there for months after Dawn's death and he could barely turn around in that tank. Because of this small tanks, when you start putting numbers of animals into them, you start getting social issues. And of course, this is the stuff that Blackfish discusses, and this is actually one of the photographs that was used in Blackfish. And you can see the rake marks on this animal. These are bite marks from other orca. But this is also a bite mark from another orca. SeaWorld denies it, but uh, I can show you guys up close on the computer if you want to see it later, but if you can see at the back of the room, just down the bottom here, there are four puncture marks that are from teeth of another orca. SeaWorld denies it because by law they cannot keep animals that are incompatible in the same tank. They say it was that he ran into the side of the tank. David Kirby was talking about this, um, and you see some of it in Blackfish, an orca who killed herself because she was attacking another. These are the issues that we have because we're keeping these animals in captivity. There is no other reason for it. Now we know that 159 orca have died in captivity. 159. This also includes stillbirths and miscarriages. And I'd like to thank uh, orcahome.de for their statistics on captive orca. They're a really, really fabulous website. If you want to know more about them, just log on. Uh, there are links from a number of our different organisations to them as well. Other issues that orca in captivity have are the teeth issues, and they get so bad from chewing on the concrete, from biting on the gates, that uh, the aquariums have to drill out their teeth. And there are issues with basically every animal in captivity to one degree or another, although we have to proudly say that Lolita, um, despite all her time in, in captivity, her teeth are looking okay at the moment. So that's a bonus for her if she's going to be able to be retired and hopefully released back out into the wild. Now if we take those 52 orca and we funnel them down, how do we choose which one would be the animal that we would represent as an organisation? To, to show what's going on. And um, this was all done pre-Blackfish and as part of um, the project that I was working in. So I was working operating independently from Blackfish when I was doing all of this, but um, keeping in mind that Blackfish was happening. So we asked the public at Whale Fest, and this leads back into um, Tristan's wonderful talk yesterday about the mapping project. And he mentioned this particular map. And what had happened was that it shows North America as well as Norway and as well as uh, the Canary Islands where Morgan is being held. And this was tagged as a map, as issues from Morgan. And the reason for that is that Morgan comes from Norway. She's held in Loro Parque, but SeaWorld, who's based in the US, was instrumental in the whole capture process and is um, involved now in trying to claim her ownership and has listed her as one of their chattels in their uh, public listing in their IPO. 
So if we take Morgan and we have a look at some of the things that make her a good candidate, so the public have told us that they're interested in her, they chose her above all the other walker, but what other things are interesting about her? Well, she's wild caught. So she wasn't born in captivity. It doesn't mean that we can't help the others, and it doesn't mean that even those that were born in captivity can't be given a better life. But in terms of Morgan herself, wild caught, she's relatively young, a female, so she's got very good potential to be accepted by others when we release her. Uh, she's got dysfunctional tank mates. There is nothing at all that is normal about the orca that are kept in captivity in Moropake. They're all captive born and they are pretty psychotic animals. Um, her location, not only uh, is she in Europe so that she's governed by EU laws, but also uh, Norway is a very good place to release her. We've got good, good locations for that, so location covers a number of different things. And the fact that the situation tank-wise where she is now is disgusting. Uh, and then there is the permit violation. We have had law professors and a number of lawyers go through the permits and they truly believe that the judges have made the wrong decision and that's part of what we're going to be appealing on the 3rd of December. So to give you a little bit of history for those of you that don't know the details, Morgan was captured on the 24th of June in the Netherlands. And we estimated from her length, by comparing it to the known age of 23 orca, that she was somewhere between three to five years of age. Probably tending more towards five, but we couldn't rule out three. So, you know, take an average and call it four. Interestingly enough, the Dolphinarian Hardavake who captured her told everybody, including the scientists that they consulted, that she was two years of age. Now, Dolphinarian Hardavake, their veterinarian, Niels Van Elk, also said on public television, it's recorded, she is only a toddler and she's still dependent on milk. Now, they only ever gave her dead fish. Now, if she's dependent on milk, why do you feed her dead fish? They had ulterior motives. They wanted to hoodwink the public. They wanted the public to believe that this animal could not be released. And they did not um, believe that they would release her. So they started feeding her from the surface so that she was begging for food. Because one of the things in their permit says that if she is institutionalized, so she's got problems, behavioural problems, she doesn't have to be released. So right from the word go, they were setting this all up for themselves. Now this is the tank that she kept her, they kept her in. I got in a helicopter after the aquarium was closed down for the season to check on her. And I took this photograph. You can see her pushed up against the gate in the corner. This was at the time the smallest tank that was permanently holding an orca in it. This is Morgan in that tank. Every time I see this photo, I, I get goosebumps. It's just so scary to believe that they thought that this was suitable. Now, they had a perfectly good, suitable environment to put her in, but they did not do it. They kept her in that tank for more than 18 months. And this, during that whole time while they were charging the public to come in, was their full education program. Now, because of the problems of her being kept in that tiny little tank, she started showing stereotypes. And stereotypes are abnormal, repetitive behaviours. And we're used to seeing these, sadly, in other animals when we think about things where parrots are plucking, polar bears are pacing, horses poke their tongues or chew on their stables. These are the sort of things that we would see in animals that, that we're more familiar with. So what would you see in an orca? Well, wall licking. She would sit there for hours and lick the wall. That's not a normal behaviour. She would also gulp, so you can see in the photo on the right how her throat is fully distended and there would be a horrific noise while she was doing this as well. Tongue rolling, tongue folding. A lot of people would say, oh, that's so cute. But this is not normal behaviour for a wild walker. And the trainers were encouraging it. So together with the Orca Coalition, the Free Morgan Foundation, um, we launched a campaign and a court case against the Dutch government. 
Now, we couldn't do it against the Dolphinarium, but they became an interest of, a party of interest in the whole process. So this court case was taken against the Dutch government. And there were two processes. And one was to challenge the export and transport permit under CITES, which is the Convention for an International Trade in Endangered Species. And the other one was to look at Morgan's welfare and her return to freedom. But they were all heard during the one hearing. Unfortunately, uh, the second judge overturned the ruling of the first judge and Morgan went to Loro Parque. And this is her in the show at Loro Parque. The reason that they said, the primary reason the second judge said that Morgan had to go there was because she needed to be socialised. So I was very concerned about this prior to it and had been in there. Naomi had um, filed a number of reports about the issues with the orca in Loro Parque. And so building on that, I went to Loro Parque before Morgan arrived and, and looked what was going on and I was horrified file a report with the judges, which was basically ignored. But we predicted that there would be a number of things that would happen. One would be that Morgan would be locked in a tiny little tank, their medical tank, for an inordinate amount of time. Two, that she would be brutalised by the other animals. Three, that she would show stereotypies and extreme stereotypies. And four, that they would force her to breed. So what's happened? Exactly, sadly, as we predicted. This is Morgan rearing up at the back. Now I took this photograph through a gate, over a bridge, past a fence, and um, that's why all that rubbish is in front of it. But you can clearly see that it's Morgan based on the eye patch. There's no doubt, photo identification wise, we can clarify it too. It's harder to see which one of the orca it is that's biting her. Um, but if you had asked the trainers who were standing right there when it happened, they could have told you. So we mapped all of the photographs that I had taken of Morgan with all the new bite marks because we had photographs of her from the Dolphinarium part of Ake where there were no other orca. And we mapped over 600 rake marks on her. We also uh, recorded a number of attacks. And so across the top is a, a drawing that shows what's happened. And at the bottom is one of the photographs. So you can get an understanding of what's going on. And if you can imagine this animal at this stage is weighing over a thousand kilos. And if any of you are divers or snorkelers and you try and list something, if it's even five to ten kilos, like your weight belt out of the water, the effort that takes. So you imagine how hard Morgan had to be hit to be lifted out of the water like this. But that goes on all the time. This is Morgan in a Morgan sandwich, as I call it. Uh, that's Kohana and Skylar uh, ramming her up um, towards the side of the tank so that they can attack her. And once again, um, here's the trainers, completely ignoring what's going on. And Morgan stereotypy are, are really quite extensive. Uh, she has chewed the concrete so much that she's lost the top third of her teeth in eight weeks. <clears throat> you imagine if you had to do that yourself, chewing on concrete. Now, interestingly enough, uh, somebody was at the park just last week and recorded one of the park guides saying that they put latex rubber on the side of the concrete to protect the orca from chewing on the concrete. Now, you can imagine if there was no protection, how much her teeth would have gone. I don't believe that the, rate, the latex is there for that. I believe it's actually there to waterproof the tank. But these are the sort of stories that they're telling the public. I was recording Morgan chewing on the, the tank um, every five minutes during some of the days that I was there. And this is the sort of effect that it's having. She's uh, got hypertrophic tissue damage on her lower jaw from banging on the concrete. Her rostrum is continually being eroded and the front of her teeth in this photograph um, are eroded. But we have been um, given some photographs recently, undercover photographs, that clearly show that the pulp of her teeth is about to be exposed, which means her teeth are going to have to be drilled. This is where the place that I would stand, uh, watching Morgan when I was there for a month. I would go in every few days and they didn't really know which day I was coming in or not. After the month, um, actually during the last week that I was there, 
uh, they blocked that off. And this was what happened. Uh, the, the, this was on the last day that I was there because they did not want me to be able to take these photographs anymore. Now the only time that you can see Morgan is when they open it up for the shows. So we had a second court case uh, with three new judges. They uh, again ignored the evidence, they ignored the laws, they basically said that, you know, this is just, we're going to look at this from the zoo's directive. They came at this from a whole new area. So our next challenge will be to uh, look at it under the zoo's directive, which is what we're, we're doing. So they decided that Morgan should stay at Loro Parque, but we have new evidence and we're hoping um, that that will help them see that this is really not an ideal place for any animal, let alone Morgan. And this is just one photograph to show you that the, the, the issue just continues on. So on the 10th of June 2012, and we come uh, basically a month later, and here's new rake marks all over her eye patch. And from the photographs that I've been sent in the last few weeks, Morgan is relatively quote unquote clean, the reason for that is that they're keeping her locked in the medical tank all the time, away from the other walker, because they know that I'm coming over to see her. So that's their way of, of giving a good um, perception to the world. But the information that we have, and Lauro Pake, I hope you are listening to this, um, that there are there have been a number of people out there going in undercover, and they have been observing how often Morgan has been kept locked in that tank, and it's most of the time. Now, Loro Parque has also said uh, that Morgan has, is deaf. Basically said she's got a hearing problem that's so bad that she's deaf. They have run tests. I have seen uh, their report. It's available online through Loro Parque. But they will not let other people go in there and do their own tests. I do not know enough about acoustics to say whether it is accurate or not, but when I read the report myself as a scientist, I think they've used very wishy-washy wording, and they are basically trying to cover their butts. It does seem like Morgan has some sort of a hearing issue, but we can't verify that. And even if she did, that doesn't mean that she has to stay in this concrete tank and be bullied all the time. She can certainly be moved out. Now, I've also had information in the last few days that Morgan has been getting tests for pregnancy tests, um, which wouldn't surprise me because despite what they said about her age, if she is, as we suggested, um, about five years old when they captured her, she could be forced to be pregnant now. So we have heard that they are testing her for pregnancy. Now, because of this, the World Cetacean Alliance, together with 19 other non-profit organisations, sent a letter off to Loro Parque asking for an inspection. Obviously, you can't read it, but you can see all these different organisations. And we have asked for an inspection of Morgan. We're <coughs> expecting to hear back from them tomorrow. We've given them a deadline of until tomorrow. Uh, they've already turned down numerous requests from numerous non-profit organisations, but the owner of the park has said that they, are, uh, that they operate in a transparent manner with their animal management. So we are hoping that with this many organisations asking for an inspection, that Loro Parque will honour that. Because if they don't, then it really goes to show that they have got some serious things to hide. So part of what we've been doing for Morgan and the whole of the captivity industry to alert people to what's going on is to try and get information out there. David's book, Unbelievable, Blackfish, Mind Blowing, and in our own small way, we've been trying to do that as well. So we've put out print media articles, uh, public service announcements, which are basically little mini videos uh, that talk about the issue and show some of these things. Social media has been incredibly powerful. Uh, we have a website for Morgan, and of course we were at Whale Fest, which was absolutely phenomenal. I think of the 6,000 people that came through there, 5,500 came past Morgan's stand and talked to us. It certainly felt like that. They were amazing fans. They were really great. And doing talks such as this and returning to Whale Fest next year. So the World Cetacean Alliance has been really instrumental in helping us with this whole campaign for Morgan because they helped us identify that the public were concerned about her as an individual. Yes, many, many people 
met the whole issue of captivity as something that they were concerned about, but they picked Morgan as one of these animals that they had a particular interest in. And also the World Cetacean, uh, the World Cetacean Alliance has been instrumental in helping organise a meeting with ABTA in Britain, which is going to be held next week. And we invited members from the tour industry in Britain to come to this, and they, they organised, they wanted it organised by you guys, right? Yeah. And so Dylan and, and Ian have sent out the invitation. And we also decided that it would be appropriate to invite the industry. So we invited three different aquariums, two who hold orca in captivity, and a third who wanted to. Uh, we heard about an hour ago that Loro Parquet has declined coming, and we don't, uh, we, we haven't had a response from the other two, have we? No. So that looks like a big no show. As Naomi said, it, it seems to be modus operandi for these guys that they just don't want to get into a room and, and have a debate about this sort of thing. But if you would like to uh, make a comment to somebody, this is Dr. Javier Almunia's email address. He has personally told me that he is frustrated with the number of emails that he's getting. So um, I suggest that you write some more and ask other people to do it because he needs to be held accountable as well. He's the one that's giving out the information about what's happening with Morgan and Laurel Parker. Expect to get some really interesting um, shall we say duplicitous answers? They are, yes, please take photos, but come up and see me afterwards if you'd like this uh, address. So, yes, the answers that he's giving out are, are quite interesting. I've seen a few of them. <laughs> okay, now the other thing that we're doing to try and help raise awareness for Morgan is that we have uh, these wonderful t shirts, and Ika Joya <laughs> have offered to help us in the same way that they helped Rico Barry's project and Earth Island Institute with these wonderful t-shirts. In fact, I'm, I'm wearing one right now. There we go. And uh, you can buy them online. But this particular shirt, I am literally going to sell off my back today for Morgan. So if anybody would like my shirt, we're going to keep it open for 10 minutes. We're going to do it via Twitter as well. So anybody out there in Cyberland, you can Twitter in how much you'd like to pay for the shirt. It's for 10 minutes from now. It's already started at 25. Oh, $25 already. 30. Bring it. 30. Wow. Cool. 40. $40. Boy, Twitter is. You better get on there. So um, at the end of this, my shirt. Where are going to? More importantly. What have I got underneath it? I'm not telling you. The other thing that we have is, um, I'm sorry, those of you out in Cyberland, we can't get them to you easily, but we have these little Orca memory sticks. They're 32 gigs. We have uh, 30 odd of them here with us. We're asking for a minimum donation of $20, which is less than half the price of what you would pay for something similar online. Um, so please, that money will go directly to help Morgan. Oh, we've got a 50. Oh, it's happening fast. <laughs> um, now, we also want to make a documentary about Morgan. We want to basically do on the power of blackfish, expose Morgan's story in the same way that people have now learned Timikin's story. We want the world to know about Morgan's. So we're going to set up some crowdsourcing. There's been a couple of people that have offered to help us. And we will advertise that on freemorgan.org and also on her Facebook page so you can search for the Free Morgan Foundation and we'll have information about that as it becomes available. But right now, you guys can get involved. Uh, how many of you here have Twitter accounts? Oh, brilliant. Wow. Okay, so what we're aiming for, this is just the numbers as of about an hour ago. We are trying to do a thunderclap. Morgan and this is basically one Twitter that goes out at exactly the same time around the world and we had to reach a goal of 500 people we've got to 732 so far but we still have 22 days to go before this thing goes out at the moment we are nearly going to reach half a million people so what I would like to see by the end of today 
that we have got this to 800 people who have signed up for the Thunderclap. So please, if you're out there in Cyberland, or if you've got a Twitter account, you can easily find the Thunderclap. If you've never heard of this before, just type in Thunderclap Morgan, and it's the top five hits on the internet. Okay, so then very quickly moving on to the court case that's coming up. This is on the 3rd of December in Den Haag in the Netherlands. This is going to High Court Appeal, and as Bill Rossiter kindly pointed out uh, last night at Blackfish, we believe that this may be the first time um, that a High Court Appeal has been heard for an orca anywhere in the world. So not only is it High Court, but we have high hopes. We have uh, very robust information, we have very robust uh, supporters, and we have the law on our side. So we're hoping that the High Court judges will take all of that into account, including the evidence. So please help Morgan. Um, we don't want her to be stuck in the box for the rest of her life. At the very least, she should be in a CPEN for uh, long-term rehabilitation. But in a perfect world, she'll be back with her family. We do know who her family is. We do know where they go. And they have been recited since she was captured. Thank you.